Welcome, New Mount Zion Church family and visitors, to another virtual Sunday School class from the Cross Comprehensive Review of Sacred Scripture. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, hallowed be your holy name, for your name is worthy to be praised. We pray this day that your will be done. We thank you, Father, for your blessings, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for loving us and for giving your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, for his burial, and for his resurrection on that third day. Father, we thank you for supplying all of our needs. Thank you, Father, for your word, for your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light to our path. As we prepare to study your word, we ask that you will prepare our hearts so that we may hear from heaven. Forgive us of our sins. And we pray, Father, for understanding as we are led by the Holy Spirit. Bless this class and every class that exalts the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord God, that you will bless our pastor, his family, our church family, and the body of Christ as a whole. Help us to be a blessing to someone in need. Use us for your purpose and for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The date is March the 12th in the year 2023. To our visitors, our senior pastor, Rev. Larry L. Roundtree II, welcomes you to the New Mount Zion Church family, where we are with God's grace changing the world through the love of Christ one soul at a time. This quarter's theme is Jesus is Lord. Despite what you see or experience, despite who appears to be in charge, Jesus is still Lord. Mankind has a limited realm of authority or influence in the earth for a limited space and time. If a man has been evil or good, if he has loved or hated, his days are numbered and his love or hate dies with him. But the authority, the lordship of Christ transcends time, space, principalities and powers. It cannot end. It cannot be contained. It cannot fail. One day, all will confess that Jesus is Lord. I am Deacon Keith Poe, and I will be serving as the facilitator for today's lesson. Today's lesson scripture, Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 9. Today's lesson focus, reject everything that causes stumbling. The peace Jesus gives us is not the absence of eternal conflict, but rather the presence of God's power at work within us. Knowing that Jesus has conquered death, surely we can trust him for our daily battles and our failures. It is comforting to know that in Christ there is always hope, even in the midst of our deepest sorrows. At the same time, we can have the assurance that our brothers and sisters in Christ build us up and support us at all times, especially in our time of need. We are in Unit 1 with the second of four lessons called from the margins of society with Lesson 2, The Greatest in the Kingdom. Be like children. Jesus' twelve disciples came from different vocations and viewed the world differently. As disagreements and arguments occurred among them, one disciple would elevate himself over another. After one such discussion, Jesus saw this grappling for position and power as a stumbling block, an attitude or a way of thinking in his disciples that needed to be laid aside. Jesus often had children gathered around him. He answered the disciples' question about who is the greatest by pointing to this group of little ones, using them as an object lesson. Jesus' singling out children 
may have confused the disciples. During biblical times, men viewed women and children as unequal, beneath them. The men surely would not see the children's innocence and vulnerability as something to be sought after. Children were not taken seriously. Men looked down on a childlike, humble nature in another man. Don't lead anyone into sin. But Jesus gathered the children around him and told the disciples to be like one of these lowly children. And he added, don't abuse, mistreat, or mislead one of these little ones. No one should ever lead another person into sin. The father has an intense punishment like drowning in the bottom of the sea with a millstone around the neck for anyone causing these children or anyone else harm. Jesus proclaimed, Woe to such person who intentionally led others to do evil. To escape the judgment awaiting those who cause others to sin, it is worth it to heed God's word and make personal sacrifices in the battle against sin. In dramatic comparisons, Jesus said it was better to cut off your hand or foot or pluck out your eye if it's causing sin in your life. Jesus' warning is not promoting limb amputations or eye removal. He was underscoring with hyperbole the seriousness of letting sin into one's life. Be intentional. Jesus called his followers to be intentional about removing sins. Anything needs to go that may hinder God's children from being an effective Section witness one is for the Christ. life need and is intended for small group discussion. We are asked to discuss how grievous it is to slip spiritually. After reading the narrative, The Greatest in the Kingdom, in your student book, notice question one. Describe what it means to stumble spiritually. Question one provides us the opportunity to describe what it means to spiritually stumble from our own perspective. You might say it is straying from the Lord either because you are rebelling or because you have become spiritually indifferent. Or one might say it is committing a sin in a momentary fit of anger, gossiping, or indulging in an immoral act. Whatever the case, such behavior weakens our faith in Christ. Question 2. What is your reaction when someone causes you to stumble spiritually? How do you handle that reaction? A question two might include rage, disappointment, shame, or despair. Some may turn to the Lord for guidance. Others may consult with a pastor, friend, or family member. Still others may confront the person who has wronged them. And question three. In what ways have you caused others to stumble spiritually? For example, setting a poor example to others. Question 3 encourages us to recall times when we set a poor example as a Christian or when our actions compelled others to stumble spiritually. In those situations, God likely enlightened them to our bad behavior, prompting us to humbly ask for forgiveness first from Him and then from those who we spiritually affected adversely. Section 2 is the Bible Learning. Study Jesus' attitude toward little children. Our Lord Jesus had a deep affection for children and He was equally fond of the childlike innocence of His followers. So much so, in fact, that he was openly hostile toward anyone who would cause them to stumble spiritually. 
Such was his teaching when he called a little child to be a vivid example of his caring love in the presence of his disciples. Who is the greatest? In Jesus' world, people measured greatness in terms of authority, status, and entitlements. Indeed, the mightiest and greatest were thought to exercise the most control over others. Everyone else existed as a second-class member of society. The greater the person, the more prestige and rank this individual could confer on those closest to him or her. When Jesus' followers understood that he was the Messiah, they saw him like one of Israel's illustrious kings, especially David, who would save the country from the oppressive rule of Rome and bring freedom. It was natural then that they wanted to be able to share in his greatness. They likely imagined the benefits they would enjoy at his side. Perhaps they reasoned that, since they had been his earliest supporters, they deserved to be rewarded more than any other members of his entourage. This week's lesson describes how Jesus patiently told those closest to him that they had it all wrong. Rather than define greatness according to the world's pagan standards, they were to consider greatness in terms of humility. Humbling oneself. Our lesson scripture begins with Matthew the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 5, from the King James Version. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5 and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. When Jesus' disciples asked him which of them would be the greatest in his heavenly kingdom, he surprised them by beckoning a little child to come to him. He then told them, that they must change and become like little children to enter his kingdom. By pointing to the lowly status of this child, Jesus focused on humility as that which qualifies those who are greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, Whoever welcomes such a child welcomes the Lord Jesus himself. Question 4 What question did Jesus' disciples ask him? The Savior's followers were intrigued by what he taught them concerning the kingdom of heaven. This piqued their curiosity about life in the kingdom especially positions of rank. They wanted to know how greatness under God's rule was determined. Question 5. What analogy did Jesus make from the little child? Matthew, the 18th chapter, verse 2. Jesus drew a comparison between his disciples and a young child. It was widely accepted that little ones, rather than being characterized by arrogance and suspicion, were known for their meekness and trust. These were the sorts of virtues Jesus wanted to see his followers cultivate and display. And question six. How did Jesus describe the nature of greatness in the kingdom? 
Jesus described kingdom greatness in terms of humility. The measure was not the attainment of position or wealth. Instead, true greatness was linked to the presence of genuine humility in one's life, especially one's treatment of others. We will now share three Bible extras. Number one, the true nature of God's kingdom. Some people identify God's kingdom only with heaven, namely the place where believers go after they die. Others equate the kingdom with the church to the point where they are the same thing. Still others think the kingdom is just a code word for ethics in which Jesus summons believers to social action. In contrast to the above deficient views, Scripture depicts God's kingdom as His sovereign rule over the entire universe, including heaven, earth, and the church. The 47th Psalm, verse 2, and the 93rd Psalm, verses 1 and 2. The details of the kingdom are presented in the pages of the Bible as an already but not yet reality. The account begins with Adam and Eve, moves to the pivotal event on the cross, and arrives at its conclusion with Jesus' second advent and the inauguration of the eternal state. Through the Son's incarnation, atoning death at Calvary, and resurrection from the dead, the Father began the process of firmly establishing His supreme authority over every entity throughout the universe. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 23 through 28. Philippians, the 2nd chapter, verses 5 through 11. Number 2. Is the kingdom of heaven different from the kingdom of God? In the Gospel of Matthew, the phrase rendered kingdom of heaven, the 18th chapter, verse 1, appears more often than the phrase rendered kingdom of God, which is more common in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. The most likely reason for this difference is that Matthew's Gospel, which was originally written for a predominantly Jewish audience, substituted heaven for God out of respect for the sacredness of the divine name. And number three, Jesus' love for children. Matthew, the 19th chapter, verses 13 through 15 spotlights Jesus' love for children. He was held as a rabbi in such high regard that parents brought their children to him for a blessing as he laid his hands on them and prayed for them. In rebuking the children's parents, the disciples probably were trying to protect Jesus from interruption and fatigue. Also, the disciples might have thought the children were too unimportant for Jesus' attention. In contrast, Jesus commended the attitude of a child as the model for those who wanted to enter his kingdom. Just as children are dependent on their parents, so too believers are dependent on their Heavenly Father for all their temporal and eternal needs. Causing Others to Stumble Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 6 through 9 But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. 
Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Verse 9 And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Jesus warned his followers that the punishment for causing a childlike behavior to stumble would be worse than being thrown into the sea with a millstone wrapped around his neck. Jesus then exclaimed that tribulation would come upon the world for the many ways it causes people to stumble spiritually. In a shocking hyperbole, Jesus said that it would be better to sever your hand or foot and cast it away than allow it to be the cause for someone's damnation. Truly, it would be far better to enter heaven with a single eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fiery depths of hell. Question 7. What did Jesus say about causing someone to stumble and millstones? Jesus said if you cause someone to stumble spiritually by your reckless words and actions, it would be better for you instead to have a huge millstone hung around your neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea so you could no longer entice anyone to sin. Question 8. How did Jesus use intentional exaggeration to make his point? Jesus used hyperbole by drawing attention to two physical aspects of one's body. The first was a person's hand or foot, while the second was one's eye. In both cases, Jesus used bold overstatements to indicate that it was better to be missing a hand, foot, or eye than to wallow in sin and experience eternal ruin. And question 9. What dire end awaited those who failed to heed Jesus' warning? Those who disregarded the Savior would not enter the kingdom. Instead, they faced the prospect of unending suffering away from the presence of God. Jesus described this foreboding outcome in terms of the fire of hell. Refuting Conventional Thinking Jesus was not alone in upending the world's definition of greatness and power. In 1 Corinthians, Paul likewise emphasized a message of salvation that refuted the conventional thinking of the day. To the educated upper classes, whether Hellenistic or Jewish philosophers, Jesus' crucifixion was hard to accept. What seemed like a stumbling block to the Jews and like foolishness to the Greeks, the Messiah crucified, was the only way for people to come to a true knowledge of God. The first chapter, verse 23. Paul's phrase, Christ crucified, was a startling contradiction in terms. To the worldly wise, the term Christ was synonymous with power and triumph, while crucified was closely associated with weakness and defeat. Yet, for one to be a Christian, one had to believe this supposed folly. Verse 24. A truly powerful creator, some might reason, would never allow his son to die on a cross. 
he would intervene. He would save his son. To do otherwise would reveal weakness. Yet God displayed wisdom and strength far beyond human understanding by not intervening. Also, in so doing, he opened wide the door of salvation. We will now conclude this section with a window on the word. The Sea of Galilee When Jesus spoke of a millstone causing a person to drown in the depths of the sea, Matthew the 18th chapter verse 6, most of his listeners undoubtedly pictured the Sea of Galilee in their minds. This sea, actually a lake, is in northeast Israel in the Jordan Rift Valley and is primarily fed by the Jordan River, which flows through the sea from the north to the south. Interestingly, the Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake on earth and the second lowest lake in the world after the Dead Sea. It is between 705 and 686 feet below sea level and its maximum depth is 141 feet. Section 3 is the Bible Application Comprehend Jesus' Deep Concern for His Followers After reading under the section From Stumbling to Recovering in your student book, how will you answer the following questions? Question 10 How do you help your sisters and brothers in Christ not to stumble spiritually? Question 11 when they do stumble, how do you aid them to recover? And question 12. How do you keep yourself from stumbling spiritually? A reliable friend who truly listens and provides wise counsel is often what a struggling Christian needs. Answers may include prayer, encouragement, and even, in some cases, confronting them concerning their weakness or sin. You should emphasize constant and focused prayer as well as studying relevant scripture passages and conferring with a brother or sister in Christ whom you respect for their strong faith in God. Section 4 is the Life Response Reach for the Lifting Hand of the Lord Jesus did not tell the disciples to be exactly like children. He is not telling us to be self-centered and naive, but he is telling us to have an innocent-like quality about us so that when we enter his heavenly kingdom, we are not overly proud and judgmental. Moreover, as his children, we are to help one another not stumble spiritually, or when we do, we are to lift one another up. The key verse of our day's lesson, Matthew, the 18th chapter, verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Praise God for blessing us once again to share in the study of his holy word. We thank God for you joining us and for supporting the Sunday School Ministry of New Mount Zion. If it's the Lord's will, we encourage you to join us for next week's lesson from John, the fourth chapter, verses 7 through 15, 28 through 30, and verses 39 through 41. Leading up to the lesson, think about obstacles that could hinder you from sharing the good news about Jesus. Look for ways you can use your talents and time to serve in the church. 
Let us close out our day's session with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our heavenly shepherd, carrying us when we stumble, faithfully nurturing us with your word. Father, we thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit that guides us into all truth. And we thank you for Jesus, for what he has done, for what he is doing, and all that he will do. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the love that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen.